Hello booktube. Sorry, I was just having a cup of tea. Wasn't expecting you so early. Hmm, just a sec. Well, here we are again. It's the uh, October wrap up time, yes. We're not going to do a TBR draw this, this month and I'll explain why in a bit. But let's go on to the books I read in November. Now I actually read 15. I only put 13 on my list but there's actually two that were in the pile that I also finished. I don't know why I didn't put them on the list because I'm obviously an idiot. So <laughs> normally I finish it, I write it down so I know what I've got to um, wrap up at the end of the month but for some reason I didn't. <clears throat> so October, good reading month, 15 books, not too bad. I've only got uh, three to go now to finish my Goodreads challenge, so oh, that's going to be done in uh, November easy. Absolutely no problem at all. So let's start. The first book I read um, was <laughs> a children's book, and it's a very old children's book. It's The Flyaway Cottage and Other, Other Stories by Enid Blyton. These are short stories that have a sort of moral to them, like not being greedy, not being lazy, not stealing, and so on. But they are really, really sweet little little stories so you've got things like Patty's Adventure and it's about a mouse family and the mouse one of the little mice wants to um, explore and do what his mum does and when he goes out he gets captured and he ends up living in a cage but he's happy in his cage so it's fine um, so they're just little stories about little morals and about animals and obviously there's the main one the flyaway cottage now I really love Enid Blyton books they're just so sweet, so simple. They remind me of my childhood. Um, <clears throat> I will certainly be reading them to my daughter when she arrives. I can't wait. When she's a bit older, when she's, you know, reading her bedtime story, I can read one of those a night and that'll last for a while. <clears throat> I need to put this book down so I can pick up the next book. In fact, I'll put it down anyway because they're all here apart from one because I listened to one audiobook. That's because it's a big book. And I read the story of Kodak by Douglas Collins. So this basically is a history of Kodak from the beginnings to the, to the 1990s and it has a lot of pictures in it. It's really fascinating. I find the bits about how they uh, took the pictures, um, developed the film, developed the cameras. Eastman's idea, George Eastman, amazing man, very innovative, always ahead of his time. And I do think that had Eastman still been around at the advent of digital, Kodak would never have fallen behind in the stakes. They would have been up there with the rest of them. Obviously, Kodak did actually invent the first digital camera, but they they suppressed it because they didn't want it to interfere with their their film sales. So it tells you all about that. It doesn't really mention the digital camera. I think it does mention it briefly, but it because uh, in the nineties, digital was very very uh, still in its early stages. That uh, there's nothing to compare it to until now. So if they reissued this. Um, and updated it right to the present day with the bankruptcy order and um, Kodak Alaris taking on film production then it might be interesting you know it'd be quite interesting to see what they said about it obviously at this point when this book was written Kodachrome was still being manufactured and, and so on and we've lost all that so but it's a fascinating journey through Kodak's history there was a couple of non-fiction books this month well two that was one of them then we have The Cooper's Field Murder by Wani e. Lee. This is one of the ones I forgot to write back down for some reason. So I, as I've mentioned before, I love books that are set in areas that I know. Obviously, Cooper's Field is part of Butte Park, which is in Cardiff, which is only uh, up the road. In this one, a woman discovers <clears throat> a body in Cooper's Field. And they set out to solve the the murder. But also during this murder, they discover some shady goings on at a care home for the elderly, um, where suspiciously they are uh, certain elderly residents are dying when they're not expected to, um, particularly when one nurse is not on the premises. One nurse is on annual leave or has a long weekend. Um, she's on her rest days, and these people just die. So it's a really good story. Wani Lee is very very good. I'm glad I found these. I still have another three of these to go and I'm really enjoying the series. Next book was one of the Terry Pratchett books through the Terry Pratchettathon, Pratchettathon, which ends in March. Uh, I don't know if I'll have finished it. I'm reading more than one a month. I'm reading two or three a month, but it, it really depends. 
and that was small gods so this tells the story of uh, the the great god Om who's not so great anymore his believers don't believe anymore and he has been trapped inside the body of a tortoise the only believer he has is brother and um he is like the lowest of the low he's a novice he's very slow he's not intelligent but what he can do is he can remember absolutely everything from the time he was born onwards his his brain remembers everything like a film so um when he was asked what was the first thing he remembered he says well i opened my eyes and somebody slapped me <laughs> so this tells the story of brother who is going to be the next prophet of om um, but of course nobody leaves that, they all, they nominate their own uh, prophet and they choose Vorbis who's not a very nice person. And so it tells the story of how the small god Om becomes back once again to be the great god Om. Because normally when a god um, becomes smaller and smaller uh, they just disappear into nothing and another god takes their place. But with Om he's not having any of that, he wants to be great again. So with brother's help they set out for him to become believed in again because people don't believe in him but then they do so after that one uh we had the stephen king book for uh september i finished that in october and that was the song of susanna um this uh takes us through the birth of the uh nemesis of uh roland uh mordred and yes they need to save the rose and uh, uh, which is the dark tower on our, our side of the world uh, and Roland and Eddie land in Maine in 1977 where they meet the author Stephen King so um they need to find out what Stephen King knows and Stephen King hasn't written as far as this yet in this book he's um it's 1977 he's at the bit where he sort of stopped and he doesn't want to write anymore and they tell him you must and I think he writes a bit more and then he stops again and then at the end of the book the last page of the book says, it tells us that Stephen King died in uh, 1990 something Ooh, something like that I can't remember I can't remember that's in the beginning of the next one let me just have a quick look it's there's yeah june 20th 1999 stephen king dies because obviously that was when he was hit by the minivan walking along the the highway or the road and he almost died so in this book he actually dies he's not gonna stay dead is he he's got to finish the dark tower otherwise there'd be no story um what i like about this is they hide a magical ball thing that allows him to travel between worlds and Eddie is it Eddie or is it Father Callahan no it must be Eddie um, in 1977 hides it um, in the subway uh, in, in the lockers at the Port Authority underneath the World Trade Center and it will be there until 2002 that's when their the rent expires on the locker but of course the World Trade Center sadly was destroyed in 2001 on September the 11th but they don't know that because it's not happened at their point in history uh, so yeah that was really a, a nice twist to, to destroy the ball that way then I read The Shakespeare Curse by J.L. Carroll this is a book I picked up at Murder and Mayhem in Hay and Y in October of 2016 and only got round to reading this year that's how many books I have I am bad the books are everywhere um, and basically it tells about a missing transcript of the Scottish play Macbeth um, you know the Scottish play don't say that word um, in which Shakespeare actually put more magic real magic in it and they're looking for this um, because somebody wants it to actually use that magic to create mayhem and somebody else wants it because it's a historical document and it's about the search for that and there's murders um, um yeah there's history there's Shakespeare there's theatre it was a fascinating book I really enjoyed it it's actually the second book by J.L. Carroll um the first one was called let 
me just see. The Shakespeare Secret. I haven't got The Shakespeare Secret, but I am going to go and look for it because I would like to read that one as well. Um, I like the idea of, a, you know, discovering Shakespeare manuscripts that have never been seen before and lost plays and alternative works, which is what this is. And basically the story is that Shakespeare actually witnessed this magical rite in the Scottish Highlands. And that's where he got the idea to write the play Macbeth from. Because um, one of the theories is that the reason that the Scottish play is cursed is because he used real magical incantations in the writing of the book. So I find that very fascinating. Back to Stephen King now and I finished The Dark Tower which is the huge final final book. Now the, when this was originally published in paperback it was over a thousand pages long. This version is 672 pages long but the writing is teeny teeny tiny and I was like oh my god this is so small. How am I going to read this? But read it I did. I loved this ending. I loved this book. I sobbed my heart out through the second half of it. If you've read it, you will know why. If you haven't, you must read the entire series. Don't be put off by the gunslinger being very Western, uh, like a Western it is, but it really picks up as the books go on and on. I love this. I cried my heart out. I cried my heart out at the end. Anybody who's read this will know why. So I do really recommend this series. I, I totally enjoyed it. Um, I may do a full overview of the series, but you know, I have talked about them in wrap up. So I haven't seen the film. I don't know if I want to. After reading the books, if they'd have made it into a mini series or into a television, like they did with Game of Thrones, I probably wouldn't be more inclined to, to, to read it, to watch it, because it would follow the story hopefully more faithfully. I know Game of Thrones hasn't, but other than the first book. Because this story was perfect the way it was, it didn't need changing. I loved it. So that's it. That's what I'm going to say. It's fantastic. You should read it. After the Shakespeare cuts, I finished listening to an audiobook that I've been listening to since April, because I don't listen to audiobooks very much. I will be next year for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, I started listening to uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Sign of Force, Sherlock Holmes story, uh, read by Stephen Fry in April. And I never put it, and I, I put it down and I just didn't bother listening to it. And then I had a bout of insomnia a few weeks ago and I thought, oh, do you know what, I'm gonna listen to an audiobook. So I picked it up, I put my phone on and I started listening to it. And in the end I thought, oh, I'll just listen to it. And then I finished the book. So I was very pleased with it. I've read the story before. I love anything to do with Sherlock Holmes. Stephen Fry is an amazing narrator. Stephen Fry is just amazing anyway. Uh, but as a narrator, I thought he was fantastic. I loved it. Um, and I've now moved on to the next book in the definitive Sherlock Holmes collection which is The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes which is short stories which is great. So I can listen to one and then stop and then go back to it when I'm ready. I then finished Marilyn Monroe Unveiled A Family History by Jason Edward Kennedy and Jennifer Jean Miller. You would have seen, you would have heard Jennifer Jean Miller's name on this channel before as she wrote... Oh, Mario and Joe DiMaggio, Love in Japan, Korea and Beyond, a book that I've spotlighted before. This is a lot thicker, bigger and full. So this tells us about the story of Marilyn's ancestry, at least mostly on one side, but it does uh, do both sides of her, her family as much as it can. Um, so obviously nobody's 100% sure who her father was, so obviously it focuses on her mother's side. Um, Gladys Pearl Baker and her mother's mother. So we've got the Monroe side, which is her mother's mother's side, and then, no, the mother's father's side, <laughs> and then we've got the Hogan's, which is her mother's, mother's side. I believe, yes. Um, and Jason Kennedy is a cousin on the Hogan side, um, and basically, he basically tells us all about her family. So, because for many years, Marilyn's family has been misrepresented in the press and in biographies, saying that they were all mad, she didn't have anybody who wanted her. Um, but he does dispel the majority of those myths in this book. She had a lot of family. They weren't crazy. They didn't all suffer from mental illness. They didn't all just disappear. Some of her family were very, very well respected um, citizens. They, Some of them were very rich. Some of them were very, very important people in the American Midwest. Um, and it just really highlight how sad 
it was that she never knew a lot of her family. She did know some of them. Um, I don't know why they weren't a part of her life. I don't know whether it was down to her mother and her guardian, Grace Goddard. I don't know. But this does give you a good overview of Marilyn Monroe's family history. And it's definitely worth a read just for that. I'm not going to go into any details about it. I know there are some people who aren't keen on Jason Kennedy and his wife, Jennifer. Um, I'm good friends with Jennifer Miller. I think she's a wonderful person. She's a wonderful writer. I think the history is fascinating. There's lots of documents in there, lots of newspaper clippings about her family, which show what her family actually were like, what they actually achieved and accomplished um, during their lifetime. Uh, and this is stuff that has been ignored by Marilyn's bi biographers over the years. And that does Marilyn a disservice as well as her family. So I can understand Jason Kennedy's anger at the way his family has been portrayed. So yeah, it's definitely worth a read. I totally enjoyed that. Next we have another Enid Blyton book and this time it's five go off to camp. So the famous five, I have a really big soft spot for the famous five. Um, I have four of the books in hardback and these ones were printed the year I was born, which was 1977. So I really like them and I'm looking out for any of these editions. So, so five go off to camp. Basically the five famous five go a camping for the summer with one of the teachers from the boys school and they discover a ghost train running through the hillside tunnels um, but really it's not it's somebody who's been seeing stuff and smuggling stuff around the country and can the famous five and famous five with timmy the dog obviously he's the fifth member can they um solve the crime of course they can it's the famous five they solve everything they're amazing so i love that Next we move on to Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. This is the first time I've read Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, I must admit. Um, I never read the Harry Potter series until this year and last year when I bought them all in hardback. So I am nearly at the end of the series. I only have the last book, excuse me, kicking the tripod and of course the play to go. I love these editions. I really enjoyed it. It was very sad. It was exciting. And that's the thing about the Harry Potter. I think they're very exciting stories. They are so well told. J.K. Rowling is such a good storyteller. I don't care what you think. She is amazing. I and I just love the this book. I love this series, and I love these editions. It, this was great. It was. It was quite heart rending rendering in in places. You really wanted to get in there and help and do anything and that's the that's the amazing thing about JK Rowling as a writer she you want to be a part of it and a good writer will make you want to be a part of it and she does so loved it then we have a Nikki French's Blue Monday I've read this one before but I recently bought uh, five four of the other ones and each one has a day of the week in it the only one I haven't got is Saturdays at the moment and this basically is about a five-year-old boy named, boy named Michael Faraday who was abducted and Frida Klein is a, a psychotherapist who um, might know something and uh, basically one of her patients describes dreams of seizing a boy who is the spitting image of Matthew. Could this be the abductor or could it be something else? So this is a very interesting psychological thriller. It's it's hard to read because there is a missing child. In fact, there's two missing children. One's uh, one's been missing since the eighties, and now Matthew. And it's so, uh, but um, yeah, it's really hard to read, but fascinating, and it all works all right out in the end. I'm going to tell you that because yeah. So I'm I'm going to move on to book two, which is something Tuesday, obviously because we've read Monday's book. Then we read uh, Tales of the Peculiar by Ransom Riggs. So I have previously read the three books in the Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children trilogy um, and then I bought the hardback edition of this because oh isn't that gorgeous with all that gold foiling. Um, I really love this. This is like modern, this is like fairy tales for a modern generation. They're new fairy tales. That's what they are. These are fairy tales about peculiar people. And what are fairy tales? They're about peculiar people. Rumpelstiltskin is about a peculiar person. You know, so they are, they're about peculiar people. And this is perfect. 
This is Fairy Tales for a New Generation and oh, it is just fantastic. I love this series. I can't wait for the next set of books in the Peculiar series, which obviously is continuing with. Um, I can't wait because I'm really going to enjoy to see where he goes, takes these pe his Peculiar people next because that was just fantastic. I just loved the idea of how these Peculiars um, discovered they were Peculiar and how they were accepted or not accepted by other people, by norms, normal people. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. The last two books I read were both Terry Pratchett's. Um, I read Interesting Times, which is actually out of sequence and um, for some reason. Um, as they say, there is a curse. They say, may you live in interesting times. So this follows the story of Rincewind the Wizard, who is sent to the Cantuate continent uh, because he has been requested, as he is known as the Great Wizard. And it's all because back in the beginning, in The Colour of Magic and The Light Fantastic, Rincewind was charged with looking after the world's, Discworld's first Taurus, Two Flower. When Two Flower came back from Ankh-Mool Pork, he wrote a pamphlet he titled What I Did on My Holidays. And this became a revolutionary pamphlet for people to um, try and start a new world, a new wave. On his journey, Rintwin meets the fantastic Genghis Cohen, Cohen the Barbarian, and his Silver Horde, and how they plan to steal the greatest treasure of the Counterweight Continent. I know. Uh, it's just fantastic. Terry Pratchett at its finest. And yet it's not one of my favourites, but it's, it's fantastic. And the last book I read, I went back to the order it should be read in, and I read Lords and Ladies. So this is a witch's story. Um, it follows on from Witches Abroad and begins with the three witches arriving back in Lanka after their trip travels to Genoa and their uh, involvement with Lily Weatherwax. So in this book, we learn that Granny Weatherwax, Esmeralda Weatherwax, once had a young man whose name was Mustram Ridcully, who is now Arch-Chancellor of the Unseen University. Um, basically, Magra and Varence are getting married, and they've invited all the dignitaries, which includes the wizards of Ankhmore Pork and Mustram. And he is simpering over the past, while she, Granny is always practical and focused on the future and the present. But the, fa the fair, fair folk, the fairies, are determined to make their way through the, um, the circle, into the real world and take over. And Granny, Nanny uh, are having none of it. There are a group of uh, people who think fairies are beautiful because they've forgotten the stories. So this tells the story of how the three witches dis do actually kill, not kill, but stop the fairies coming through with the help of the long man. And there's plenty of innuendos in there. So Nanny's well at home as we know. Um, yeah, I love anything to do with witches. Having played Gra Nanny, we Nanny Og in uh, Weird Sisters, oh, I just love them. I'd love to play the player again. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Very funny um, way to round off the month. So yeah, that's it. So those are the books I read in the month of October. We're now into November. I'm really enjoying what I'm reading. I am doing non-fiction November. So this is why we're not picking anything out of the TBR jar this month because I've got a huge TBR with the books I've picked for non-fiction November. I've also got to read Stephen King's Firestarter. And on top of that, I have two books to review for uh, Head of Zeus and I've got three downloads from NetGalley, which I haven't hauled because I don't haul ebooks because, you know, you can't hold them up. Could put a picture up, but no. So that is what I read in October. So I'm currently working my way through your wrap-ups and hauls, among other things. If you've read, again, any of these books, let me know. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Did you love The Dark Tower? Did you hate it? Do you like Terry Pratchett? Do you hate him? <clears throat> what about some of the other books? Did you enjoy them? Again, let me know what you're reading down in the comments below. And if you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe. I have had quite a few subscribers in the last few weeks. So thank you very much. If you're new to the channel, I really do appreciate it. And don't forget to share this so your friends can see it and um, like it. Give it a big thumbs up so people can find it in their, their YouTube thing. So yeah, that's it for my October reads. And we'll be back soon with some non-fiction November wrap-ups, I would imagine. I'll see you soon, BookTube. Bye.